An issue that's critical to social concepts in astrobiology is humans' relationship with their environment. Certainly in the history of Earth, history of humans on Earth, um, human relationships with the environment has shaped social systems and societies. And it would be expected that as we move off of Earth, that our relationship with extraterrestrial environments will also shape societies there. In 1914, the Irish poet William Butler Yeats wrote, in dreams begin responsibilities. And what he was stating there was that as soon as we begin to dream of a potential future or an action, it's at that point, very initially, we need to also begin to take responsibility for the outcome of those dreams. In paintings like this that we've all seen of westward expansion in the United States, the pioneers there are certainly full of dreams and aspirations as they move into this frontier. Were they taking responsibility for the effect that they would have on the new environments that they were encountering? No, they didn't. For example, hydraulic mining, it was a practice of using water cannons to erode soil away so that gold and other resources could be obtained. And it was an environmentally damaging process. It was an inefficient, polluting, unsustainable. It failed to consider long-term consequences and limited opportunities for future generations in addition to decimating any biological species that happened to be downstream. Similarly, this photograph here was taken in uh, the 1850s. It was the first oil well ever drilled in Pennsylvania. And the person in the foreground there is Abraham Lincoln, just to give you an idea of the, of the period that this was happening. But did they consider the responsibility of their dream of that oil well? Did they consider the impact that that oil well would have on not only the United States, but the globe in the years to come? These photographs were only 60 or 70 years after the first well was sunk. And it certainly changed not only the environment of the United States and the globe, but also social systems, economies, health, even spiritual aspects of life. It changed everything. And so now we're moving into Mars and the moon, and we should expect the same kinds of environmental effects. And we should take responsibility for those dreams. So far, we haven't. If we consider again that painting of the westward expansion, that mythology of the frontier, and then also consider this poster from the Mars Society, the next frontier, the mythology is the same, even the same artwork is employed here. Um, people heading, in this case, astronauts, walking into their future, walking into their new frontier, are they making the same mistakes that the pioneers did in that initial painting? Again, yes. We build roads here and we'll build roads there and the same with pipelines. So the same kinds of actions that we've taken here on Earth for the last hundreds of years, we'll be duplicating them on the moon, Mars, and beyond. And we would expect to have the same kinds of environmental impacts, yet we are ignoring that. We see concepts like this, artists' drawings of Mars habitats. Where's the landfill? How has the land changed? Are they polluting? aquifers that might lie below those areas? Are there actions for closing other possibly better uses of the land? Again, we are not seeing that because adverse impacts interfere with the image, with the mythology of this new frontier, the same way that it interfered with the mythology of the westward expansion in the United States. We don't want to repeat the same mistakes we made and have potentially the same adverse outcomes. 
Elon Musk certainly has a dream and aspirations. Here he states, the economic base of a Mars colony will be what people do here on Earth, everything from opening an iron foundry to a pizza hut. But is he taking responsibility for his dreams? Again, we may repeat the same mistakes we've made here on Earth, and we should avoid those. So what would be the environmental impact of roadways, processing plants, launching and landing sites, fuel manufacturing, and so many other kinds of activities? How will we begin to grapple with this problem? And how might our search for life, extraterrestrial life, be affected by environmental impacts? The one thing we do know is that adverse environmental impacts also adversely affect any life that might be found there. So that's certainly another consideration. Eric Mack, a science writer, stated, can you build a city that likely includes mines, fuel manufacturing facilities, and nuclear power stations without harmful contamination of a planet? Maybe, but our existing data set of exactly one planet does not demonstrate that humans have much of a track record for such capability. So we recognize this as a foreseeable problem, and we also recognize that nothing is being done about it. How can we minimize or avoid it? What kinds of measures can we take now to ensure that things will go a little bit better? The Outer Space Treaty says nothing about environmental assessment. It, it does, of course, speak to forward contamination for biological pollution of uh, extraterrestrial areas, <clears throat> but nothing is said about the environment itself. We do have tools that we've developed here on Earth to help us with this process, again, here on Earth. The National Environmental Policy Act in the United States in um, the late 1960s and um, the advent of environmental impact assessments and needs for environmental impact statements has become routine in construction industries. It's a routine measure that's taken to reduce environmental impacts, and it's been very effective. The companies that do those kinds of acts, um, construction, for example, now consider it routine to do environmental impact assessments. Joanne Gabrinowitz, um, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Space Law stated, the US government would have to take responsibility for making sure an American company like SpaceX doesn't go to Mars and turn it into a big red landfill. They should begin speaking with one another early enough to allow the government to understand a company's needs and for the company to understand US legal obligations. That way they can fashion the least restrictive regulations possible. As I'll discuss in a minute, I think that she is definitely correct that something needs to be done to address this evolving problem. But I don't believe it's the US government, um, that it's uh, the US government role to undertake responsibility for that. I think the responsibility lies elsewhere. And so we've developed environmental impact statements looking at things like the Mars Exploration Program. JPL did an environmental impact statement for the Mars Science Laboratory and Mars 2020 rover mission. These comprise hundreds of pages that address environmental impacts, but not one paragraph addresses environmental impacts to Mars. They all focus on environmental impacts to the Earth, specifically to the United States and coastal waters. So they do discuss things like the effect of these programs on traffic patterns in Cocoa Beach, Florida, um, but not one word about impacts to Mars. So the environmental impact statement process has not been used at all. And it's not required at this point. Uh, it's government policy to not require environmental impact statements that address impacts to extraterrestrial areas. So how might we start a process for extraterrestrial assessment? The first option, like uh, Joanne Gabrinowitz stated before, is through legislated regulations, international treaties, and what I'm calling here hard law. And with these kinds of approaches, 
um, there are certain drawbacks, significant ones. They're authoritative and prescriptive. They're binding and inflexible. They tend to be slow in adapting to change and very slow in being adopted to begin with. They're challenging to enforce, even harder to punish, and they're not practical given current policies and practices. If you consider the 2015 Commercial Space Act, for example, under the Obama administration, that reduced regulation and encouraged commercial exploitation. And certainly under Republican administrations, the same approach to reducing regulations has been seen. So I don't think a legislative approach is practical. A second approach, which I do think is far better, is for the use of soft law, independent of government regulation. And in this particular option, the industries themselves would meet to generate standards within their own organizations to create international codes of conduct and best management practices. And I think that would be a phenomenally good first step. They're quick to approve and implement. They support industry objectives. They're transboundary in nature, international in scope. They're non-binding, so they're less threatening to the industries. They're flexible in adapting to change. They can be open to public comment, which I think would be very important. And they're more practical in achieving short-term goals and could evolve into customary laws, um, similar to the way that uh, practices on the high seas evolved into maritime law, not through regulation by governments, but through soft law evolving into customary law. Why would industries agree to do such a thing that might actually um, reduce the range of options for them? And I think the answer is that it's in their best interest to do that. They would control the process before governments are forced to impose regulations through public demand. They could identify problems before they evolve, reducing costs. They would increase investor confidence enhance public relations, which I think is critical, and it would help to build a database of efficient practices. So some obvious truths that come out of this is that there will be adverse environmental impacts, just as we've experienced here on Earth. And an environmental assessment process can help to maintain future development options, increase commercial and scientific efficiency, decrease the scope and cost of mitigation, foster better choices among competing uses, sustain resources, reduce human impacts and reduce impact to humans, improve investor confidence, document where, when, and what is done for posterity, and grow a database that would be helpful to everyone involved. And so in dreams begin responsibilities and we are now dreaming and moving into, rapidly moving into fulfilling those dreams in outer space. But we don't want to recreate the same kinds of environmental issues in space that we did here on Earth. And that is definitely a possibility. An environmental assessment process, I think, is essential in fulfilling that responsibility. So thank you very much. I would sincerely appreciate your comments and questions. So please write me if you wish, William Kramer, numeral one at gmail.com. And also uh, I've discussed in much greater detail these ideas in several papers um, that I've published and those are available through my website, outerspaceconsulting.com. So again, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from you.